My name is Dustin Kelly, but everybody calls me DJ. I'm prior Army, serving as both a Ford Observer and a military police officer. I spent the last 14 and a half years as a police officer and detective in a large metropolitan police department. Two things that I've learned throughout my career. One, everybody has a story to tell. And two, the best stories are true. This is the DTD Podcast. Here we go in three, two, one, and we're live. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the DTD Podcast. This week in the studio, a man who was a three-time volunteer in service to his country. In 1967, he volunteered for service in the U.S. Army, then did a briefing for jobs in the military, and after just viewing the John Wayne classic, The Green Berets, my guest volunteered for Special Forces. But that still wasn't enough. My guest finished in-country training and was asked to volunteer for a top-secret group and operation that was happening at the time. After attending a briefing and signing a 20-year non-disclosure agreement, my guest joined the secret war and started operating in Laos and Cambodia. This is the group that the Viet Cong only talked about in hushed whispers. Conducting raids, ambushes, POW recovery, sabotage, and a litany of other clandestine operations, this unit was responsible for dismantling of enemy forces where no one and no operations were supposed to be. Cut off from the rest of the world and with only dire missions on their agenda, my guests and his band of marauders were responsible for the destruction of an enemy that no one thought existed. Over 50 years later, the veil has been pulled back, and now the world now knows the sacrifice that my guest and a very small number of soldiers gave willingly. Some called him Idaho 1-0, some knew him as Tilt, but after this conversation, the world will know him by another name. It's my pleasure to humbly introduce John Stryker Meyer. What's going on, my friend? Not much. I'm just enjoying the music. Great introduction. Thank you, DJ. Yeah, uh, I'm so happy you're on here, and I cannot wait to get into this. Uh, there's so much to talk about because I don't think that a lot of people know your story or the service or the gratitude that they owe to the group that you were with. But I want to set back to 1966. Yep. You were working at Yosemite Park. Took you two years in college to decide that that wasn't the place for you. Let's talk I about. Flunked out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, flunked out. I would say fuck out, DJ. <laughs> I worked hard at it. So y- you have this conversation with your dad. You know that something's different is on the horizon. That you got to change. So mm-hmm. let's start right there. Oh, yeah. Uh, we knew it was coming. And uh, Dad explained that the, at the time, there was a draft in 1966. So I was on the list. And as soon as you flunked out of college, you lost your student deferment. And sure enough, it came. And uh, in between, I read the book, The Green Berets. And I said, well, if I'm going to go to Nam, I'd like to go with these guys if I can get through the training and uh, measure up to their standards. So I enlisted in the Army and... Uh, Went through the uh, process, volunteered when I was going through AIT, and after advanced infantry training, we go through basic advanced infantry, went to jump school right from there, right to Fort Bragg, began training to be a Green Beret. Seven months later, graduated, had some more training, and then April 1968, three months after the Tet Offensive, it was launched by a massive uh, wave of attacks across Vietnam. Um, we landed. And then uh, wound up at FOB one after the in-country training, and we and you mentioned that NDA, we signed that after a top secret briefing. We volunteered. They came out said we're looking for volunteers. And my, Johnny McIntyre, my buddy, goes for what? Can't say. Either you're in or you're out. We signed it, and that was the NDA for 20 years. We could not talk about this secret operation, which was SOG, running missions across the fence. Well, if we. Cambodia. If we could, I want to go back because I thought it was interesting when I was listening to your story and I've, I've watched tons of interviews, looked through your books, read your books, all that kind of stuff. 
when you got introduced to the Green Berets, you had seen the movie, but you were going through kind of a program that was saying, hey, uh, the way you described it was, hey, be a cook, you'll always eat food, you'll never be hungry. Hey, be a mechanic, you'll never not have transportation. And then this guy shows up, there's two staircases coming up to the stage, and he jumps up onto the stage, said the special forces are looking for a couple guys, I'll be in the back of the room if you need me. You got to put me, you got to put me in your mind frame there of seeing this guy do that after you go through all of that other stuff, because the minutia in the army, as you know, and I know can grind on and on and on. Yeah. Well, that's the way it happened, but your time frame was backwards. Okay. The the recruiter was doing advanced infantry training when I was at Fort Gordon, Georgia. Okay. And it was a rainy day. And so part of your training, you have all these options. And so there's like six, 700 people in this huge auditorium. And of course, we're all sitting on the floor. And all these guys come by, these fat cooks, the combo guys, and all this stuff. <laughs> and then the last person was this banty rooster. And everybody else had gone up the stairs on the sides. Like you said, he came in and it was raining. Everybody else had raincoats. He had his fatigues and, and his bray was, was wet, walked up. Vertical jumped on stage, turned around, and just said what you said. And I jumped out off the floor, man. I said, yes, sir. Yes, Sergeant. I'm ready. <laughs> and I figured everybody would get up and have the opportunity. It's like there's only four or five of us. I'm going, you people are crazy. You know, advanced infantry training, you're going to get a month R&R, and you're going to Vietnam right away. I'm, I'm a city slicker. I need a lot more training before I go to Vietnam. Well, and that and- was and it's so funny that you say that because you had a couple guys that were, the way I understand it, that went kind of through the training with you, were in Vietnam with you. Um, so when you go there and, and you already had an idea for the Green Berets and stuff, when you see it, though, of course your idea was, and I thought it was very slick when I heard you say it, hey, you guys are just going to go to AIT and then you're going straight to Vietnam and whatever happens, happens. At least oh, you yeah. could you could control your destiny a little bit. And that's what I thought was cool, that you were really far thinking in that instead of very short term. So what was kind of your idea behind that other than being able to not just go straight over there and go into whatever happens? Well, uh, you know, the book, The Green Berets, explained what because robin moore was a was a civilian and he wanted to write the book the green berets and they told him if you do it you've got to go through the course and i i think he was he was a veteran from uh, the korean war or world war ii i forget but he he was old enough but still in shape and so he went through the course and that's the way he wrote about it so he explained some of those procedures and including the training and uh you know i i knew I mean, I was just a city slicker that grew up in Trenton, New Jersey. My mother wouldn't even, she got upset when my granddad bought a cap pistol for me. We had no weapons in the house, nothing, ever. So I knew I needed more training. And if I was going to go to Vietnam, by that time, we're reading, you know, the Idrang Valley had gone down. The 173rd had got his cock cleaned at the rubber plantations. And uh, I said, well, this boy, if I'm going to go, I got to get as much training as I can. And, Luckily, as it t- things worked out, we got the extra training with special forces. And then in country, we had, when we landed, there was in-country training. And that was three weeks. Everything from airstrikes, patrol, tactics, helicopters. And then at the very end, out comes this little guy. We're looking for volunteers. And uh, it was for SOG, the uh, secret war across the fence. It was an eight-year secret war from 64 to 72 where the Green Berets ran the missions across the fence. What we didn't know at the time was that it had the highest casualty rate of the entire Vietnam War, exceeded 100% casualties. And uh, we learned that later, of course. Well, and I had heard you talk about that. And the reason that it was so high was because some guys were getting like eight and nine Purple Hearts. Yeah, Rob ha- Bob Howard, who received the Medal of Honor, he was for a mission in Laos, in December 1968, um, he was put in for 11 Purple Hearts. He received eight. And several of our guys had multiple Purple Hearts, including guys who would just, you know, they'd go into the A and D section and say, look, this Purple Heart was only shrapnel. Throw that thing away. 
Well, I think it was a different kind of soldier. Don't you agree? Even even from uh, people that were volunteering to go to Vietnam and stuff like that, you guys were just a different breed, cut from a different cloth. Do you agree? Well, to hear us tell, particularly, um, you know, because uh, when you go through the training group, Special Forces training group, you know, over time, you just see the other quiet professionals that are there, how they act. And if you're going to become a Green Beret, you're not joining it to become um, have it like the Marine Corps where they have three Marines and every three Marines, they have a, a photographer tagging along to make sure they document their story. And we were going to, to, to fight communism, a deadly enemy at that in Southeast Asia. So that was the mission. And you went in to do the job, to be the quiet professional, to hurt the enemy as best as we could, and um, to not be there searching for it. And there, over time, there were a few people that came in. And, if, and oddly enough, the few men that came in who were like, oh, I, I'm really here. I want to get as many medals as I can. They always blew it. They just fell apart in the field. You always talk about giving credit to the guys that came before you, not necessarily uh, Green Berets or anything like that, but but people that came before you that did special operations. Can you talk a little bit about World War II Korea and the operations that those guys were doing that kind of changed the tide of war? Well, yeah, I mean, um, in you know, when we grew up, they used to have us. You know, there were many movies that were made about World War II, the heroism therein. And there were other books, including a book like on a, um, there was a German special agent who had this daring rescue of Mussolini, who was on some mountaintop that the French had, or some of the German enemy had this. And this guy went in, rescued him. They, and it was like a mission impossible. And then we had our Rangers, in uh, in World War II, we had the OSS agents like Jack Singlob, who uh, jumped into uh, enemy-held French territory, and they had to not only deal with the Germans, they trained the local people, the French people, the French resistance, and then they also had to deal with the communists. The communists were behind enemy lines, but they they operated differently than the OSS men. The OSS men were there to hurt the Germans. The communists would do missions where if they could get publicity or help their cause, they were very political, even in World War II, before Normandy. So people like Jack Singla, we heard about, we read about. And so he was in World War II, spec ops in Korea. And when we landed in Vietnam, he was the uh, officer in charge for SOG. During the eight year secret war, there were five colonels that took different turns. And Jack was the, uh, he, he had the longest tenure, two plus years as Chief Sog. And his, t his tenure ended in August, 1968. And then he went on to other promotions and finally retired as a two star. So we knew about them. And the Korean War, there were spec ops. Again, little talked about, but they were there uh, going behind enemy lines to to uh, hurt the enemy wherever they could, interrupt their missions. And uh, so by the time our war came along and we had our government had entered these treaties or whatever, some kind of a legal quasi thing that said we would have no combat troops in Laos or Cambodia. And the North Vietnamese publicly said, oh, of course, we wouldn't. But this is... So in 1964, we pulled out. We had Green Berets in Laos, SF people in Cambodia, and they pulled them out according to those agreements. And the communists were just lying. They're, they're, they're communists. They lie anywhere in the public, and the media will faithfully report what they lie. And uh, by 1964, they had been working on the Ho Chi Minh Trail for seven years, bringing down supplies, improving the trail, seeing the U.S. presence increase. And by the time I arrived in 1968, they had 25 to 30,000 NVA troops in Laos alone. 
They were there to keep the Ho Chi Minh Trail open to bring supplies south. They worked and forced the indigenous people there to work with them in the traditional communist way. Help us be our slave labor or we will kill you. And in Cambodia, they had anywhere from 30 to 100,000 troops. And our conventional troops could not chase them into Laos or Cambodia. So they would come across the border, attack our people, and go back and lick their wounds. And so with SOG, it was like, hey, we got to go find out what these guys are doing. In 1968, that was the most serious year, the highest casualty rate for us. And when I landed at FOB1 Fubai in May of 68, by that time we had several teams that had been completely wiped out, a couple that were um, decimated. And one, which was uh, ST Alaska, everybody was killed on the team except for the team leader who escaped and evaded. His name was John Allen. He's able to come back, made it back to the compound. And he was one of the men who was there when we entered camp in the May 21st or 22nd, 1968. And uh, earlier that month in May, another team had been wiped out. And then my team, uh, we got off the South Vietnamese helicopter. The team got on with Spike Team Idaho. Glenn Lane was the team leader. Robert Owen was the assistant team leader with four or five indigenous members of the team. And they, are, they are, went missing in action. They remain missing today. And those two Green Berets are amongst the 50 Green Berets that are still missing in action from Laos and Cambodia from the secret war. And uh, um, that also we documented over 80 aviators that died supporting the Green Beret uh, SOG teams that are on the ground during the eight year secret war. So many questions come to mind off that though. My, my first one is, and maybe you can explain what people might not understand. So you have this agreement where people say, we'll stay out of Cambodia and Laos. Of course, the North Vietnamese say, yeah, we would never do that. We see them. We have CIA watching. We have all different kinds of things going on. We know that they're making raids and coming back across. Why right. was there never an effort made by the United States government to commit full forces going across? Of course, you guys decimated enemies that were going across. Why was there never a decision made to put the full force of the United States going into those countries and smashing that down? Well, it was because of the early days of the war, um, we kind of backed into it a lot of ways. And um, the State Department was involved. And, you know, back then... Maybe even true today, I think there's more communists in the State Department than there were in Hanoi. And um, they had that policy in place, and they, in the State Department, was rigorous in fighting. And there, our commander, like Jack Singlob, had more battles with the State Department than he did with the enemy. Because we were always trying to get, uh, just for us, to be able to go across the fence and be more effective. Even they had to fight to get enough uh, close air support, like A1 Sky Raiders and uh, fast movers. And I'm told that in the early days of the war, when I talked to Jack, he told how they had to fight all the time. Because we'd be on the ground with a six-man team, and they hit us with anywhere from you know, a small squad to hundreds, or like with Lynn Black on October 5th, 1968, a nine-man recon team came up against 10,000 North Vietnamese Army soldiers during a one-day battle. That was a classic. And in the end, we lost three, and they lost. They had 90% casualties from the wounded in action, killed in action. So 90% of a 10,000-man division was 9,000 casualties. And, that, and that's from the team on the ground, Air Force, Marine Corps uh, gun support, fast movers, and SPADs. A1 Sky Raiders that supported Lynn Black, and that team was Spike Team Alabama. Well, at one point, didn't weren't they losing so many that they were actually stacking their dead on top of each other to get an angle advantage? Uh, well, that was uh, two days later. <clears throat> well, in October 5th was Lynn Black's mission, and that was uh, one day. Um, during his mission, in the early parts of the contact with the recon team, 
the team killed so many NVA when they rushed them that they went out and started stacking the dead bodies. And they had a cordon of dead soldiers. And later in the day, uh, they ran out of bullets. So they went out and picked up the AK-47s from the dead soldiers and picked the magazines and weapons from the dead soldiers to uh, combat the enemy. So that was October 5th. On October 7th, we were in a target, Echo 4. We made contact around 2 o'clock. And then um, my assistant team leader, or my team leader, Don Wilkin, he and I were talking, and I was we had been trying to get TAC air. And we had so much contact with the enemy. They kept coming. We were on a little hill. There were six of us. Don Wilkin, uh, Davison was there. And then we had three indigenous troops. Hep, Sal, and Fook were there. And they kept, but we were on a small knoll, and they kept coming out of the jungle at us. And at one point, to your question, we killed so many, they began stacking up the bodies. And I couldn't see it at first. But Don pointed out and said, look what they're doing. They're stacking up the dead so they can get a better angle to shoot down at us. Can you talk about kind of the mindset of that enemy? I mean, just saying that to stack the bodies to get an angle on you, what kind of soldier were you fighting? Because I think that you, of all people, give them their respect of fighting, that they were, you know, just animals in a fight. Uh, well, they're tenacious. There's no question about it. And they earned our respect. We we never cast dispersions on them, particularly when they came at us wave after wave. I mean, how do you not respect an enemy that's willing to die like that? And the other thing was, you know, if they didn't do what their NVA told them, then they knew that their officers and their non-commissioned officers would kill them right there. And that was uh, one of the facts. There's now some books that are coming out from Vietnam where North Vietnamese Army regulars talk about coming down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, ducking and dodging from the aircraft strikes, fearing being hit by us, and then realizing that they didn't do what they were told, that their sergeant or their lieutenant would kill them. So there's there's a motivation on both sides. And they're like, do the mission. And of course, they were told from propaganda, they said, look, the French were here for 150 years, America wants to do the same thing. They want to enslave Vietnam and take our riches. And the North Vietnamese controlled all the media. So the North Vietnamese people never knew the truth about why we were there. Because like the South Vietnamese on my team, they knew that their government in South Vietnam was corrupt, period. No questions asked. But they preferred to live under a corrupt government that they knew and could live with and function day to day rather than live under the thumb of communism. And that's why our men were willing to die to fight it, to fight the communists. And then they got paid a little extra to, to work with the Green Berets for our missions across the fence. I, I heard you talk. Um, you were you were given kind of a speech or a lecture and you, you talked about the communists, and you mentioned that thing in in particular that, you know, the way they treated them, what their mission was. Um, and you, you spoke very much about that if we don't start teaching people today about communism and the real communism, because you mentioned certain people that had written books and lived in a village. Actually, you spoke about a woman who lived in a village. Uh, and she wrote a book about the difference between a thriving village and then when the communists came in. And oh, you, yeah. Her name is Thon, T-H-A-N-H. And her book is called Kissing uh, Ground Kisser. And it's a, it's an excellent book. And it does. She it writes about her thriving village during the Vietnam War. And once April 30th, 1975 came when the artificial involvement ended. The communists came in and took over their village, had spies in the villages. They would even put people in their houses. And they would encourage the neighbors in a traditional communist way, which would be a neighbor 
If you tell us about anybody who says anything against the North Vietnamese government, you tell us and we will punish them and we will punish them severely or maybe kill them. And they did it. And then they would come in and take over the, the village. And so instead of having the uh, thriving village where fishermen were bringing in fish and other people had their businesses, they came in and set up the communist way of doing business. And the village went to shit. And then her parents picked two children, two of their children, to, to escape. And she was one of them. And she escaped. And it took her, God, over two, two plus years before he got out, went through, the, went through uh, going across the South China Sea, landing in, uh, gosh, I forget what the country was. But she became grievously ill. And at one point, she was so sick, lying on the ground that people came by and dug her grave, assuming she would be dead in the morning. But she made it home, and today she lives in Huntsville, Alabama with her husband, John Boyer. And they, uh, they have, a, I think, two children, and she's wonderful. And her book, my God, they talk, it's a classic example of what goes wrong when the communists take over a thriving village. Are you worried about that happening now? Oh, absolutely. Let's you talk about You look at it. our country today, how the institutions have um, done everything over these past 50 years. When I came home from Vietnam, I was surprised at the anti-war movements. And we had this, you know, back on our college campus in Trenton, New Jersey, you had the Student Democratic Society, but they were infiltrated by the communists. And they would come on campus and they would lie trying to get student activists to join their cause, which would be anti-war and then to build up a system that over time would attack America from within. They attacked the families, anything that they could break down, religion, because the middle class and, and, and our religious uh, Judeo Christian foundations of our, that our country was built on was the rock of our country. And they kept do, gnawing away at it. Well, 50 years later, they've come a long ways to have this um, uh, so the CRT now, where they're bringing it into classes and they talk about, instead of talking about our history, you know, America, regardless, is still a classic country in world history for actual individual freedoms. No one will ever have what we have. And even today when we're under attack from within and you have an administration that is doing so much to hurt our country, you have to wonder why. And even with the two tiers, two tiers of justice in America, we watch that all unfold. And how long does it go on? You know, thank God we got elections coming up and hopefully we can get enough of the word out to people. And there are organizations. And I think that with this administration uh, pushing the Green Deal and clean energy so hard at the expense of destroying our, you know, the petroleum industry, attacking it from day one that Joe Biden took office and all those uh, executive orders that he signed, I mean, mind boggling. And they, they go on and on. It doesn't stop. And the border, now we have over 2 million people that have infiltrated our country across the border. And they got that idiot that runs the, um, the department of oversees the Border Patrol. And he'll come out and just outright lie. And sadly, a lot of the media, there are books now that document how the media, many in the media, not all, but many, when... Joe Biden or somebody else like this, this clown Majorca, Majorcus, I can't even say his name correctly, but he lies to the American public. And the majority of the media, like the Communist News Network, MSLSD, all of them report their what they lie. And they don't go down to the border and show the huddle masses coming across. And there was a story today, so today being... Um, July the 18th, 
And there's a story in the Washington Times where there's more than 15,000 dead bodies along the border from during this infusion. And they quoted an Afghanistan veteran who was in combat in Afghanistan talking about how severe the casualties are at our border. And that's where the cartels are taking over. They're coming into crossing the border, hassling landowners in America, and the feds do nothing. Now, don't get me wrong, the agents on the ground and the border patrol agents, the customs agents, the men and women that are there that are trained to enforce our immigration rules and laws, they're good. It's their middle management and, and the upper management. And, you know, our vice president is the, whatever her title is, she was given the job of going down and overseeing improving the border effort. She's been in Texas once, and she was like two or 300 miles from the actual border. She's never been to the major centers like Del Rio and a couple of the other counties down here where the local sheriffs are pulling their hair out. And there are some networks, um, Newsmax, Fox News, they've got a couple of reporters as and then Epic Times are at least reporting these stories on a daily basis. But again, the Communist News Network, uh, the New York Slime, the Washington Compost, they're all like ignoring these stories and they're going to have a tremendous impact on our country. I have a couple questions that came up. One, I wanted to ask you later on, but you brought it up about coming back to the United States. Uh, even in New Jersey at the college, you had, you know, protests yep. and things like that. I want to know what you're thinking, because I can do it from a law enforcement perspective, especially in these last couple of years, how we feel about how the public perceives us and everything. When you're over there and you you swear to give your life in defense of this country, you see your friends fall all around you, and then you come back here and you see the way people treated veterans coming back here because you you went over there twice, so you got to see in between and then at the end too. How do you process that coming into the United States and seeing something like that after everything, horrific scenes that you've seen? How do you make peace with that? Well, um, you know... We had civics classes in history, and the classic example from the, from the Revolutionary War would be our farmers who put aside their plow and went to war, and when the war was over, they went home, returned to their farms. And look at George Washington. I mean, he could have called himself a king. He could have done anything he wanted at the end of the Revolutionary War, but he turned over his power as the general. And then when he was president, they wanted him to run for a third term. He said, no. And there are quotes from King George from uh, England and politicians from France that were quoted later as saying, we couldn't believe that George Washington turned over all of that power for another administration. That's unheard of. And that kind of thinking is what, what my thinking was, because I knew when I went in, I had my enlistment. It was three years. I got it extended so I could go back to Vietnam in 1969. And I believed in what we were doing. And the South Vietnamese on my team were just outstanding men. We were close. We were a good team. We did good missions. And um, I felt more comfortable with them than I did being back in, at that time, I was up at the 10th Special Forces Group in Massachusetts. We had people in Boston and a lot of the uh, anti-war people there. And it's kind of like, man, you, you all haven't seen communism like we have. We've seen what communism, if you don't do what they want, they will come after you. If it takes an army, they'll come after you and kill you until people do what they want. That's a little bit different that America going out aiding like our enemy after World War II. Look at what we did in Japan, Germany, and other countries under the Marshall Plan. Unprecedented in world history that any country would do that. So that's the framework in answer to your question. In my mind, I served my duty. I did it. 
came back, I went back to college, and I watched, and you just watched these things go on, the attacks on our country from within. And I think a lot of people, after the institutions, uh, <laughs> the colleges put this thinking into people's minds that America is a bad country. To come out and attack Washington and Jefferson and uh, for being slave owners, when there are still a lot of slave owners around the world today, but we don't talk about that. And uh, our country wasn't perfect, but we've made a great deal of strides and improvements over the year. But like Black Lives Matter, Antifa, and then we get back to his two standards of justice here. Over a billion dollars of property during the year 2020 riots and 2021 riots, buildings destroyed, billion dollars. How many police officers were killed? Over a thousand wounded during those riots. And there is not one investigation by Congress or any organization, the fan belt inspectors, also known as the FBI. That's, in my opinion, the upper management is famous, but incompetent and corrupt now, as proven. When you had 51 people from the intelligence community that came out and signed a letter saying that the rumor about the Hunter Biden laptop was Russian propaganda when it wasn't, and they lied, and not one of those people have ever apologized or retracted that statement. And to the New York Post credit, they put their faces on the front page earlier this year, posting the fact that they all lied. Hunter Biden's laptop is for real. And there's a lot of there from the book um, by Peter Schweitzer, red-handed, detailed. And he documents everything he writes about Hunter Biden their corruption, the links to China. I mean, and then you look at what, how many days ago did President Biden take our oil reserves from the special reserve, I forget what the title is, and send some of that to China. When we have our gas prices going out of control here and they forbid and they hinder our oil industries and petroleum industries from drilling and expanding, where two years ago when Biden came into office, gas was much less expensive than it is today. That's just one example. And that's that whole erosion. And I think the people that are pushing these policies, they're left over from the Obama administration. And that they're back in power. And they they feel this whole Green Deal and everything else, anything they could do without realizing or thinking about the middle class. And the middle class is hurt. And um, just hopefully this election, we can begin to turn things around and get a good candidate who will be for America in 2024, as opposed to somebody that would be of the ilk of Joe Biden. So going back to that, you, you talk about yeah. middle management, the higher management being the problem. Do you feel like that same thing hindered you guys in Vietnam? Oh, clearly. I mean, we're... <laughs> Uh, here's a classic example. We, the, like as I said, the State Department was um, just horrific in their conduct with us and for us to do a better job in Vietnam. And we had a mission where our, our target was to find three missing NVA divisions. So on Thanksgiving Day, 1968, our recon team was inserted. We had to find the first, the third, and the seventh. NVA divisions, which were MIA, the DIA, the CIA, and any other IA couldn't find them. Well, we went in on Thanksgiving Day after a delicious Thanksgiving uh, uh, meal in the morning, and uh, we found them. We barely got out of there alive. And during our briefing, they said, you cannot use white phosphorus grenades in Cambodia. And uh, they had no, we had no uh, TAC air. The only air support we had were helicopters. Now, granted, it was the uh, 20th uh, Special Operations Group, the Green Hornets from the Air Force. They had state-of-the-art helicopters. They had miniguns. 
and they were just amazing pilots, fearless. And uh, we found the base camp and we got chased back, barely got out alive. And uh, had not had it not been for the Green Hornets with their gun runs and um, the helicopter coming back to extract us promptly, we would be Cambodian fertilizer. So as we're leaving, I see some NVA and I throw a white phosphorus grenade down. So this is Thursday, Thanksgiving Day, 1968. Two days later, our team gets inserted. Our mission is to bring back a POW. We get inserted, set up this perfect ambush on a road. And there's like thick jungle and then the road. We're taking pictures of the NVA when they're driving by. And our our demo guy, John Bubba Shore, went out and put an anti-tank mine in the road, dug it in, and we had a wire coming back so we could detonate it, blow the truck up and get a POW and go home and get a bonus and get an R&R. And uh, we get a tactical call. General Creighton Abrams orders your team to <laughs> cease and desist your mission. Go to your LZ now. And they said that in the clear. And Creighton Abrams, had he was the one who was the chief commander for all of South Vietnam. He replaced Westmoreland. I was stunned. So, yeah, we pulled out, went back to the LZ, got pulled out. And they came back. Premier Sihanouk from Cambodia filed a formal protest with the U.S. government over that white phosphorus grenade that we dropped in Cambodia. I did it. Now, at the time, the commanding <laughs> officer for FOB6, he pulls me in and says, look, I said, what the hell happened out there? You, you were briefed not to use white phosphorus. And I explained to him what we had gone through. And so he said, well, what's the official story? And I said, you know, it was an accident. We were under enemy fire, and that damn white phosphorus fell out of the helicopter and somehow it exploded. And I'm really sorry that we offended the Cambodian government. Now, Premier Sihanouk was not concerned about the 100,000 NVA who were living in his country preparing to attack our troops and our allies. That didn't bother him. But my white phosphorus grenade, uh, he filed a formal protest. And, of course, the State Department raised hell about it. And it just shows you how this is, like I said, November 1960, how ludicrous and political that bullshit could, could rise. Well, you've spoken about that. That premier was pretty corrupt. Oh, clearly. And, 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 was, and, and he left after a while, right? He wasn't ousted. Well, he, he left. left in 1970. And when he left, it left a power vacuum. He... At least in his corruption, he was able to still keep the country of Cambodia intact. So when he left in 1970, there were, we had another operation, Operation Tailwind, where we had a, a hatchet force of 116 indigenous troops, and we had uh, 16 Green Berets that went in to a target area to assist the CIA because the CIA was fighting the communists in Laos that were going to Cambodia. Sihanouk left, and there was a power vacuum. So the NVA were sending troops down, and they were going to try to take over Cambodia. Well, Operation Tailwind went in, took the pressure off the CIA. They thwarted that effort. But within a couple of years, the Khmer Rouge came in and took over, and eventually you had the killing fields. Okay, let's go over a couple numbers, John. Uh, and well, then yeah. I, I, I'm setting up these numbers because I want to ask you some questions behind it. So uh, according, we had 542,000 troops committed. 10% of those were combat. 90% were support. Those numbers sounding good to you so far? Oh, yeah, that's the, way, that's the numbers we had when okay. we got there, yes, sir. 20,000 Green Berets, 2,000 yes, SOG members, and yep. then across the fence, actually hatchet force people, 400 to 700, correct? Well, that would be hatchet force and recon. Okay. So, one, why were the men and the mission so important to the war cause? Well, at that point in time, um, there was nobody else to gather intel from the ground across the fence in Laos and Cambodia. We knew what we knew the enemy was there, but we had nobody there. So our primary mission is what it could vary from an area reconnaissance 
to a point reconnaissance. So an area you go in, take pictures, get on mountain ranges, or get down on highways to see what was going on. And if we saw enemy activity on, on, because they had trails that were invisible from the air, because the NVA would cover the trails with tree branches and tie the branches over, and the air, you know, jets or even Ford, uh, Ford air controllers could not see the trails, but they needed people on the ground. So that was our job. And they knew we were coming. And at that time, we never realized how compromised you are. And later, make a note to yourself about how compromised you are. And I'll get back to you as we get a little bit later on here. But um, so that so a point mission would be to go in to blow up enemy fuel lines, to capture a POW, to do a wiretap. After a B-52 arc light on a target, we would have to go in to do a BDA, a bomb damage assessment. And then um, sometimes just try to capture a live POW because the best source of intel is a POW. And uh, nobody else was doing it. The war was top secret because of the political side of things. We had to do our top secret missions, getting asserted by helicopters. And then by later in 1970, they started uh, doing combat jumps. Their first combat jumps from Halo into um, Laos and um, they had a total of five and then they also had 12 static line jumps during the history of SOG but that all happened after I left Vietnam. Um, When you talked about that you set up the ambushes different if you were going to grab a POW and go back you set it up without shrapnel and stuff so that you could do a, a little bit of different damage. So I thought it was really interesting how you did it. Can you explain how you guys did those ambushes and and how you changed them a little bit in order to be able to bring living people well, back with you? I, I have to. I, it wasn't I who did it. I used a tactic, but the tactic was developed by Lynn M. Black Jr., who was on that team with Spike Team Alabama, October 5th, 1968, when they came up against 10,000 NVA. Lynn was in the 173rd and um, had a tour of duty with his brother, came back with special forces. And the what we had talked about was how to develop an ambush on a trail so you could kill all the enemy but knock somebody out. Well, Lynn, being the creative guy he was, <laughs> he took – a block of C4, as you know, you can cut C4 down. You can cut it like the it's a one pound or a two pound bar, and you can cut it. In fact, our Vietnamese used to, uh, you could burn C4. You could ignite it, it burned hot. You could cook your coffee, you could cook chicken noodle soup with it, whatever you want to do. It was, it was a great, flexible tool. <laughs> Very well, much so. Yeah. So Lynn took a little piece, put it out six feet and detonated and he kept detonating bigger and bigger pieces until he knocked himself out and the idea was and of course he did it and the day that he did it he came back to camp his hair's all wild and he's talking really loud because he damaged his hearing but the good news was he knocked himself out and so what we had was an ambush so if enemy troops were coming down a trail six feet from that block of c4 one person would be literally knocked out and then we have claymore mines on each side and the claymore mines would kill any human being or any living anything else living on that trail so we have one on each side then you have security and then claymores in the back in case they would counter react to us and so um we use that tactic now, I never had the chance, nor did I actually capture a POW. Well, Some that was because you got called back. Weren't you on that mission when you got right. called back for the white phosphorus? So you never got to use it. That was Cambodia. Another time in Laos, we had the perfect uh, ambush set up. We got inserted. They didn't know we were there. And they were, we were watching them walk up and down the trail. They had their AK-47s on their shoulder. And... Uh, Sal was running a wiretap because we were right next to a telephone line. 
So we had a wiretap running, had the POW uh, ambush all set up, and then we called the uh, our forward air controller, nicknamed Covey, said, hey, I gave him the code. The code is, we will have a POW tell me when to meet me at the primary LZ. And then Spider Parks, who was my first one zero, had that famous line, I'm at 10,000 feet. I can't see the mountain you're on, let alone find your an LZ. And that's when this, that's when everything went to shit. And uh, so we had to pull it down. And then he said, you got to get the high ground and uh, don't, you know, avoid contact with the enemy because we can't give you tactical air support. And we were on the ground for five days and five nights. We Can finally you... made contact on the fifth day. And that was the mission where uh, during the night, the NVA, one NVA crawled up and touched my boot just to see if we were there or not. It's just like uh, a little too close to the enemy. Let's, if you don't mind, because I'm glad we got on this story. Can you walk us through those five days? Yeah. Um, what had happened previously, um, this was November of 1968. And we knew that you know, after Tet of 1968, which was at the end of January and February of 68, November, we were worried about the enemy massing for another Tet offensive, possibly, in January or February. They really wanted to get teams on the ground. And we had tried to get in. In the morning, we'd go into a primary, secondary, and an alternate landing zone. Each time we got shot out, we'd go back to Fubai, have lunch, They'd give us a new target. We went in, got shot out, primary, second, alternate. And this can wear you out. I mean, because you're flying in the helicopter, you're descending into the target, and then you have a quick firefight. Or well, an not to cut you off, you got to explain how you descend in, too, because it's not normal just to descend in, not in those King Bs. you got to do it a certain way. Well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, just for your listening audience, our, <laughs> we had the South Vietnamese 219 Special Operations Squadron from the South Vietnamese Army, codenamed King Bees. And uh, our team and many SOG recon teams and hatchet forces survived the war thanks to extreme courage and the aviation skills of King Bee pilots. And in Laos, when they inserted us into a mountainous target, they would come up to the target and they would spiral in. And the last second they would flare, the wheels would touch down, and then we'd be out of the helicopter into the jungle. They would take right off. And uh, so we went through that two or three days in a row. And we had transferred some of our people because some of the South Vietnamese were just getting worn out from that rigorous experience it's hard to imagine but just getting shot at three times have lunch go back and get shot up again with bullet holes in the helicopter so we, we finally came to this target they gave us a new target i had a redesigned team had a, had a uh, strap hanger henry king that came with us and i went in with an eight-man team we got on the ground and i was so happy to be on the ground instead of getting shot out we moved up this mountain and I pushed the team really hard. Usually we would move 10 minutes and wait 10 minutes. But on this day, because of the uh, vegetation we were in, it was thin. And we put the team online and just went up this hill. I pushed them. We came to the trail. We crossed it. On the other side, set up the uh, ambush, the Lynn Black ambush. Sal had the wiretap in. And then we had that problem with the weather. We got socked in. So within three hours, three or four hours of the time we got inserted, the weather closed in and the mountain couldn't even be seen from the air. And so with that, we pulled in the wiretap, pulled in the ambush. We did escape and evasion and uh, went, our, went our merry way. And uh, by an hour before darkness, we could hear the dogs and... By darkness, Sal climbed a tree, and he told us there were hundreds of people coming up the mountain looking for us with lanterns, and they had their dogs. So we would put out black pepper and mace along our trail 
And we finally came to a, a really small, like a brook, small stream. I put the team in it. We went up there. Now it's dark. We normally wouldn't move at dark. But on this night, because of the exigent circumstances with the dogs, no air cover, I wanted to get as far away from the ambush site and the LZ as possible. So we got in that stream, went up for a while, and then we had the guys go out and come back, putting out false trails, put down the powdered mace, and then the um, black pepper. So finally, the, the banks were maybe 10, 14 feet high. So I, the team went up. We set up an RON, a rest overnight spot, and we had a circle. And I was facing that stream bank. So about 2 o'clock in the morning, 1 to 2 o'clock in the morning, Two NVA were in the stream, went up the stream, and their lantern ran out of fuel. They turned around and came back down the stream, and I'm watching them. Of course, when the lantern went out, then I could only hear them move. But I could hear them. When he got by me, Hep, my interpreter, coughed. And it was like the pucker factor became minus zero. And uh, this NVA soldier was really cool, man. When... Only when the breeze moved would he crawl up. He, it took him a while. But finally, I'm sitting there with my car 15, pointed at him, my feet are spread, and I got my car 15 between. He came up and touched my size 10 regular jungle boot, and I heard him catch his breath. Now, had he done any other movement, I would have fired one round, but he didn't. He waited until the wind blew again and backed down that that bank to his buddy then he took off and then at first light we were out of there and we continued up the mountain and uh we moved all day and by the time we got to the top of that mountain our team was just beat i was beat we were all tired at about midnight we had one of the strangest things i ever had during my time on the ground we uh heard an aircraft so I'm going through the FM frequency on my radio. I could hear the Russians talking to another Russian, and they came in for an aerial resupply in Laos. And we watched a drop zone with lights light up. The plane came in and dropped their supplies. And I'm on the radio. I'm trying to get some kind of tack air, anything out there. It is, anyway, we couldn't get them. They went back. But that was, so we were there. We, we stayed up there for three more days because we had the weather reports. Then finally, on the at the end of uh, the fifth day, we went down and uh, set up an RON that night. And I had uh, broken my tooth eating uh, one of the rations, so I had a bad tooth with the pain. And one of our other guys was coming down with a cold, and so we were at the RON at night. And the next morning, we we finally got extracted. Another team made contact, and we made heavy contact, but we left. We were able to get out alive. A couple questions come up from that. When that guy reached up, and I know you've been asked before, but I got to ask, he spends all that time to come find you. Yeah. And he touches your boot and thinks better of it because he was about to get it. Oh, yeah. So my question is, he spends all that time to come up there just to fill your boot to back away. And he doesn't even have his partner at the time. You have any idea what, I don't want you to think for him, but do you have any idea what he was maybe trying to do? Was he just probing? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think he wanted to, he, again, they're in the stream. So uh, that little brook, that water, the flowing water. So they got the noise of the water. And when Hep coughed, he may have been curious as to whether or not he actually heard a human noise or not. But he was cautious enough to only move when the wind blew. So I think he knew there was something there. And when he touched my boot, he figured out that the boot had an angle to it. And on one side or the other, that boot, there had to be a gun pointed right at him. I think he figured that out by himself, DJ. And that's why he left cautiously. Had he not, he would have had a lead lunch. <laughs> so... I love what you wrote in uh, Across the Fence. You, you talked about you guys, uh, no uniform, you were spies. And you wrote, we were like James Bond without the car, women, or escapes. 
So, <laughs> yeah, you are a very much poor man's James Bond. I love that when you talked about that, but you said that one, a big thing that you point out is you had no idea before you started doing this. Spice had no protection and they could be executed pretty much on site. So does that change the way you go into these missions, the way that you approach your objectives, or do you keep going at it the same way? No, we kept going at it the same way. I mean, um, nobody officially, like during the briefings, would say, remember, you guys are going in with sterile fatigues, everything you said, and you are officially a spy. But nobody said that. But Spider Parks, our veteran team members like Pat Watkins, John McGovern, they pulled us aside and said, look, remember, keep in mind, and during our, during our first briefing, our top secret briefing where we signed the NDAs, um, they outlined that concern for us, but um, they said it so quickly, you know, but we all heard it. Right. But that was just the cost of doing battle. I mean, we our mission was we were the tip of the spear at that time. And uh, there was that institutional pride to get the job done, no matter what the cost. And James Bond didn't have the King Bees. We had the King Bees. Right. And we had helicopter support elsewhere, the 101st Airborne, gunships, both from the 101st, from the 1st Cav, and later on from the uh, Muskets with the 176th Aviation Unit out of um, Chulai. And they were great profoundly fierce and these young uh, 19 20 year old warrant officers they could jockey those UEs and they and the early UEs never had enough power but those guys would we rang the bell they would come help and that included the Marine Corps Scarface HML 367 they were assigned to that secret war for the entire uh, period of the eight-year secret war and they lost good Marines there aviators that died supporting our teams on the ground. They're part of that whole aviator MIA thing we talked about earlier in the interview. In, in talking about that, you said you never talked about, you know, your spies. No one ever really points that out. But you also talk about in cross in Across the Fence um, the very cool weapons that you've had. And you've already mentioned one tonight that you had the CAR-15. Right. Uh, you, you talk about having uh, grease guns, 45 caliber Thompsons, 38 specials. Do you have a favorite gun that you always carried with you? Well, yeah, the CAR-15. That's it. And then for additional firepower, uh, we had cut down M79 grenade launchers. So the M79 fired a 40 millimeter round. So you had um, high explosive, you had shotgun canisters, you had CS, a couple of different varieties of CS gas, if you wanted to use that to break contact, and um, incendiary rounds. I forget what, what the nomenclature on those were. But um, we carried the CAR-15, had over 600 rounds for it, and then I had 10 to 12 rounds for the M79. And then we always carried um, a maybe 10 to 12 hand grenades. And there was at least twice, DJ, where I went through my entire load of 600 plus rounds for the CAR-15 during those extended firefights. Used all the M79 rounds, all the hand grenades. To the point on extraction, we were down to the last hand grenade and down to the last magazine. That, that's uh, absolutely insane. Did you have a favorite? Uh, now, one thing I want to point out, when you say you cut those down, I think yeah. we shouldn't gloss over that. You really cut those things down. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, the easy part was cut. They had a they had a huge stock. So we cut that that stock off and just had enough grip so you could grip it because when you fired the 40 millimeter round, it had a pretty good kick to it. And then the barrel, you know, I, I have to go back and, and measure this because we've talked about this before, but the barrel, we cut it down, uh, all the metal part, we cut it right to where the wood support for the weapon itself was. So we cut it there. And again, uh, 
we kept cutting back. We had we went through four or five of those to see because the M79 round, when you trigger it, it spirals out. And it's got to make a certain number of rotations while in flight before it's armed. So the question was, how short could the barrel be to fire around so it would work? And uh, you might want to ask me if I received my first self-inflicted wound during that training when we were cutting those things down. And the answer is yes. <laughs> we got it down to the shortest stub. And the question was, okay, if you fire it and you fire it close, and will it explode? Well, the good news is it was cut short. We fired it close and it exploded. That's what we wanted. We wanted to be able to fire it have an impact at close range in the jungle with the enemy. The bad news was I felt something sting me in the back. I turned to Rick Howard. I said, Rick, a bee just stung me. So he pulled up my jacket. You dumbass, you just shot yourself. Mm -hmm. So we had to go back to the medic, and they had to get them to cut it, cut the damn shrapnel out of my back. I still got a scar back there. Someday when I'm down, I'll show you my scar. <laughs> but that's too so embarrassing. So let, let, let me ask you, with, with all this stuff, uh, a, a question came to mind in reading through all your stuff and listening to you talk and all the lectures that you do and stuff. Do you think that everything happens for a reason? I, I want to ask you that question right off the bat. Phew. That's a good question. You know, um, as we go through life, whether you're on the ground in a firefight, trying to do your missions there and then today, we never know what cards we're going to get dealt. I mean, like my wife and I, we lost our son two years ago in a car accident. And uh, when you go through these moments in time, um, one of the things that helped me then and today and two years ago when we lost our son, it was knowing that we had a mission, which was here was the family. There we were to tip the spear. And whatever mission they gave us, we had to do our utmost to try to accomplish the mission. And uh, that was an attitude that sustained us through the worst of times. I mean, there were a couple of nights we would be playing poker. Uh, I remember one night in particular, we had a really cool soul brother. And uh, he was playing uh, poker with us. And there was another guy, I forget his name. But uh, Bubba Payne, he was a complete delight, an absolute fearless soldier, came in, and it was his second or third mission, and uh, he got lost. He was a MIA for years. Then they finally recovered his body, I believe. I forget how many years ago. But, you know, one night you're playing poker with guys, and the next night they're gone. They're not there. And another time we had a, a poker game and the helicopter was on an eldest son mission, which was we would go in like when we were on the ground, we always carried doctored enemy ammo. So the AK-47 rounds, 7.62 rounds and um, um, mortars for their, for their small mortars. We would carry them. If we came across an enemy cache, we'd put that ammo in there or put it along the trail somewhere, making it appear as though a fellow soldier had dropped it. And when they used it, that ammo would explode in their face. And it was a psychological impact. Well, we had a, on November 30th, 1960, we had a King Bee with seven green berets that was en route to Laos for an eldest son mission. And it got blown out of the sky. And there were a few nights, well, actually, it was about a week and a half before that, we had been playing poker with four or five of those guys. And they were gone. And, of course, at that point, they were MIA because they were in layoffs. And they were eventually recovered as well as the King Bee pilot, co-pilot, and the door gunner. And they're all buried in Arlington National Cemetery today. But here we are and and i was down south at the time doing that tdy mission that we talked about from thanksgiving day they pulled me back our team went back 
because that severe loss, seven Green Berets on one mission. Do you think with all the loss, uh, and, and I don't want to go too much into your to your son, but do you think with all the loss that you've seen in your life, with everything that you've had to accept, do you think that it it helps give you a different mindset? Do you think it helps you work through something like that better? Do you have, I don't want to say an advantage, but do you definitely look at things different that, that you know it will become better? Or do, do you understand what I'm getting at? Well, I understand it crystal clear. And, um, you know, when we had, uh, we lost a couple of men early on after I arrived at FUBA. And then on top of that, like I said, we had, uh, March 27th, 68, uh, several members of our team were shot up, remained MIA. March 28th, an entire team was lost. In May, we had a helicopter shot down, lost two or three Green Berets there. ST Idaho was wiped out. ST Alaska had every member on the team wiped out except for the one zero, the team leader. And this is just May and March. And earlier in the year, we had several other recon teams that were in uh, other FOBs, FOB 6 and 5 down south, Contum. And Spider Parks and I, we, we had some, he was my team leader. Spider was the 1 0 for Idaho. And uh, Don Wolken was the 1 1. And when we lost several people, you know, Spider and I talked about it. And then particularly after the Echo 4 mission where they stacked up the bodies to get us. And the only thing that saved us was a King B flown by Captain Tin who hovered and took enemy ground fire for 10 minutes waiting for us to get to the helicopter and get the team on board to leave. And, um, you know, Spider could tell that we had been through hell. And he talked to Don and I said, look, you guys, you know, if you hadn't killed them, they would have killed you. And you can't let this get you down. You have to be mentally tough. You got to put it aside. And he said the same thing when we lost the other team members on other teams. And um, so in answer to your question, I we had to process it. We compartmentalize it. In my case, you put it away. And sometimes, I mean, this past year, Memorial Day for me was very difficult. Um, my wife and I, with our son, my our other son, who was wounded in accident in Iraq in 05, of whom I am very proud. And he's just turning 40 years old. He's still with us. He's working hard now. And uh, we were there at the cemetery, the National Cemetery here in Tennessee. And uh, all that comes back. At some point, you think about these things. They really hit you. Sometimes they hit you harder. But the, uh, like we said in the, earlier in our conversation, we all had a mission and we had to get on with it because if we didn't, then somebody else would. And uh, that was the, the mindset. And that carried over today. Like when we lost our son, you know, as the dad in the family, I, I tried to be the rock around which our family would handle the grief, rebuild, and to move on into the future. And it's a daily process, as painful as it is. And you know, it's challenging to your faith, but you just got to believe that somebody somewhere has got a better plan that we mere mortals just don't understand. And I think it holds through, through your whole story. And the reason I originally asked that question was there were so many key people that were put into your life through that, through what you just talked about with your son. There were so many key people put in through your life at points that were almost like I don't want to say a miracle that they were put in there, but it was definitely someone, one of your guardian angels saying, I'm watching you. I got you. I'm going to point out the first one because we're going to go through some people and I want you to talk about them, how oh, you sure. feel about them, because I think that these are important guys. So I want to start with spider. First oh, off, yeah. that's the, the coolest fucking name I've ever heard in my life is spider. And let me tell you what makes spider additionally cool, which we didn't mention in the book because he never talked about it, but Spider was Comanche, Indian. I forget. I think his dad was the Comanche, and I forget what his mother was because he never talks about it. But, you know, 
you can handle you can hand spider any kind of instrument in the world a shovel a, a trenching tool an axe a knife he would throw it and make it stick in the in a telephone pole he would kill a man with an axe in a heartbeat he could just anything he threw it stuck but i met him going through training group he was the pitcher for our softball team i was his catcher and sometimes i played center field but spider could bring it and uh and so when I landed at Fubai with Johnny McIntyre, we we saw Spider. Now Mac had been in B Company, and we Spider and I were in A Company, and we beat McIntyre's softball team. So we called him B Company Puke. But you know, but we, let's back up even further than that, John. When you get there, you're not the rank that you actually wanted to be when you land there in Fubai. No. And, and and right, well, you and McIntyre uh, are not the rank that you guys want to be. Now, for whatever for whatever reason that may have happened, uh, Spider promoted you almost instantly, and you figured out that since he promoted you and you got that rocker on, you could roll up your sleeve and people would just think you were a sergeant. Right? Yeah, because McIntyre <laughs> and I got busted before we went to Vietnam. So we got demoted from PFC, Private First Class E three, to Private E Deuce. So we land in country. We get Johnny went to. Uh, 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 Spike Team Louisiana, and I went to Idaho. And so that billet for the American Green Berets was an E8 or an E9. But in May of 1968, Johnny and I were there at E Deuce, and Spider promptly, like you said, within a few weeks, I got promoted to PFC. And he told me, roll that damn sleeve up so that people see the top of that, of that stripe, and they might think you're a sergeant. Don't let them know you're only a knucklehead PFC. <laughs> so that's that's one guy that I think and and like I said it's these times that they're slipped into you um and and they make such a difference in the end you don't think about it short term with this guy another one that I wanted to talk about was Paul Villarosa okay now oh yeah. first off you have to describe Paul Villarosa and and just cuz that's a whole story in itself but oh, yeah. he was inserted with you teaching you camo and then goes over and you can tell what happens in Vietnam. Well, yeah, when we went through training group, myself, McIntyre and a few other guys, we our, our training for our military occupational status was camo communications. So in 1967, the primary form of communication between Green Beret A camps was Morse code on a radio. So you had to get to a certain speed. Well, Mac and I, Tony Harrell, and a few others, we all got recycled. And Paul Villarosa was an E7. He brought us in on the weekends. At night, he held special classes to help us uh, get through it. And he had three tours in Vietnam previous already under his belt. And uh, he also was a phenomenal uh, communicator with Morse code. So he got us through our MOS training. After MOS, we have uh, the final phase of training, which is three or four weeks, I forget now, which ends with a field training exercise. You get your, and then our day, when we were done, it's like, here's your certificate, here's your orders, have a good day. And we left. No, no parade, no nothing, you know, not that we wanted it, but that's the way it was. If the war was cranked up, they needed bodies. And then we did some more training before we go to Vietnam. And then we talked earlier about that um, top secret briefing where we discussed the NDAs that you talked about. And it was sometime after that, that we learned that Paul Villarosa, the man that we all held in the highest esteem, the most respected Green Beret that we knew at that time, he had been killed in action January 1st or 2nd in Laos on one of the first missions out of FOB4 in Da Nang. Not only was he killed, but the NVA went up with a flamethrower and charcoal burnt his body and two or three of the indigenous team members, and they left one of the Americans alive so that that American could go back and tell the others what had happened. And of course, the message was, you come to our you come across the fence to Laos, we'll do this to you. 
So we were shocked and uh, stunned. And uh, McIntyre and I were like, WTF? Paul Villarosa, three tours of duty, his first mission out of FOB4, he's KIA. We didn't know about the uh, um, the flamethrower. We learned about that later, but tragic. And he was just a man we all so held in the highest esteem. So here's two guys so far in your career. One, you also forgot to talk about Paul and the tattoo that he had on his neck that said, <laughs> cut here. That's right. He had a tattoo that said, cut here. <laughs> And uh, he was fearless, man. He was just an outstanding soldier. And uh, uh, they ran into a really superior enemy force that was ruthless in nature. And uh, not only did they wipe out the majority of the team, but uh, they did psychological uh, warfare to the most cruelest form on Paul. And so there's two guys so far that we talk about, Paul and Spider, so far. Paul is the reason that you get through combo training oh, yeah. and, and get on without him. Who knows what would have happened? I mean, we, I we never know. I could have been an overweight cook somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never would have been hungry. So right. you have that, you have spider that, that automatically promote you back that, that you knew from, from back then. The question that I have though, is does it change your mind state? from when you know what you're already getting into, but you see a guy like Paul and that happens. And of course you guys say, you know, what the fuck just happened? <clears throat> Does it make you a little more nervous to think this guy who you held in the highest regard that had all these combat tours that had all this experience, if it can happen to him, it can definitely happen to us. Oh, clearly. And, and don't forget my personal experience. I mean, myself, Johnny McIntyre and John Hutchins, we flew from after our briefing the top secret briefing, we fly on the King B up to FOB1. We get off the helicopter, Spike Team Idaho gets on the helicopter with Glenn Lane and Robert Owens as the two Green Berets. And they're wiped out. The team that went in on the bright light, Spike Team Oregon, everybody was shot up, one person was killed. George Sternberg, Lily had his jungle boots blown off by a hand grenade during a firefight. He was shot in the arm. At one point, he flipped the bird to the NVA who shot him. And then he killed that son of a bitch. And uh, uh, even when they're leaving, when George was on the helicopter, a round went through, hit him in the chest. But fortunately, he had a uh, ERC-10 radio in his pocket. And that round hit him and blew him back against the wall of the helicopter. Had he been sitting by the door, it would have blown him out of the door. But, um, so in answer to your question, that was another day in hell. And mentally it's like, holy shit, Glenn Lane had fought in the Korean War, highly decorated. He had had another tour of duty before he ran missions and became a highly respected 1-0 of Spike Team Idaho, just an amazing soldier. And so, the, yeah, me and Mac, we're the green, greenest grass. We're the greenest green berets in town. And these guys are falling down, not falling, but we lost them. And it's like, holy shit, what's, what's waiting out there for us? But, you know, spider parks, and we were very, for, in my case, and Johnny's too, because he went to Louisiana, which had a lot of uh, of highly respected indigenous troops. And we had uh, Sal, Hep, and Fook on our team. So uh, Spider became the one zero because he had been on with Lane. And, and, you know, and Spider was so lucky because he ran several missions with Lane. And Lane says, look, you're so good now. We're going to give you your own team. So you're off Idaho. So he signed off from Idaho was in the process of beginning to work with a new recon team when Idaho got wiped out. So because Spider knew the indigenous people, he became the one zero, the team leader. And then they went out with Hep, our interpreter, and Sal, who was his counterpart, the South Vietnamese team member on the team. And uh, they hired um, five or six new South Vietnamese, three of which were 15 years old two of which became stone cold killers and outstanding recon men within four or five months. They were running point 
and just outstanding soldiers. Um, so you answer your question again, it's like, holy shit, what are we getting into here? But we're in and spider trained us and spider and Sal with his experience cause spider and hep, I mean, um, uh, Sal and hep had been fighting for over two years, running secret missions across the fence. So their experience, they work with spider who was experienced Don Wolken, uh, became assistant team leader and I was the radio operator. And Don was just a great, a great soldier. So when Spider got a job flying Covey, he left Idaho. Don became the one zero. We had a couple missions. Then I became the one zero from October 68, right through to the end of April 69, went home for five months, came back, got back on the team with Lynn Black. And Lynn had been on the team with me during March and April of 69. So he knew the team, the team knew him. And then the Doug Letourneau, the Frenchman, came on the team when I left. And they're both highly respected recon men. And uh, so I felt good going home, knowing that the team was in their hands. And uh, so the training. And, you know, we were just fortunate that uh, it, our number didn't come up when we were across the fence. I mean, we, we were close. There were several times that, uh, well, you know, we, we had that Christmas Day mission. And uh, we barely got out alive on Christmas Day. Again, thanks to a King Bee pilot, Captain Tuong, who we buried, sadly, three years ago in Westminster, California. But he saved our, our team that day, Christmas Day, 1968. That night, after I took my shower, I'm walking back to my room, and I could hear... This little cheap radio playing in the background, but it's playing Silent Night. And then I just stopped, you know, it's like, holy shit, it's Christmas. Thought about home, Trenton, uh, my family, what we would do Christmas Eve, our church service, of course, Christmas with granddad, our family. And uh, I said, you know, to myself, I'm going, I don't think I'm going to see my 23rd birthday. I really don't think so. So this is Christmas, December 25th, 1968. I was 22 years old. And my birthday was January the 19th, same day as Robert E. Lee. And I really didn't think I would live to see my birthday. You're talking about three weeks. Yep. Because we were lining up new targets. And then on... Uh, but Well, hold on. Let's go back to that for just a second. Yeah. Uh -huh. So why now? Why? Because that's a very fatalistic approach, but you have never talked about that before. So why now did it hit all of a sudden? Well, it was Christmas. And, uh, you know, we had had that close call on Thanksgiving Day. Before that, we had had a, uh, I had a very personal experience where um, we had, I got pulled out on a rope from a target. We, I had repelled in and we were compromised. I'm glad so you're talking about out. this. Yeah. And uh, I mean, the long story made short was I didn't hook my D ring. And um, when I came out, we got, I got drugged through the trees. And so my arms were bloody and I ch changed my arms because we're flying at a hundred knots or like or over a hundred miles an hour at 5,000 feet. And people forget you're on a jungle, you're all sweaty from the firefight and everything. At 5,000 feet, you're freezing your balls off. I'm trying to hang on to this rope because I didn't put my D-ring in. Got flipped upside down, much to my embarrassment. My web gear came down and choked me out. I began to pass out. My I had a rope seat, it's called a Swiss seat. Went down to my knees and my legs were spread. And then went down to my feet. And I was just like your New York City hooker, just flying through the air. With all my gear, my 90 pounds, well, not 90 pounds, but most of my gear, my rucksack and my web gear was choking me. And I signaled to Henry King and the uh, King Bee to get me down. And, f and right when I passed out, I read the headline in the Trenton Times newspaper, local boy dies in Vietnam. And I was pissed for two reasons. One, the headline was below the fold. And two. Well, you got to uh, explain why that's a big thing. Well, when all of our locals died in the Vietnam War early on, like from 63 up to 1968, there's always a front page story. Whoever was killed, 
that story, that person was from Trenton, New Jersey, or any of the surrounding townships, and that would be an A1 story. But mine was below the fold, which is less significant than like a couple of people that I knew. Like we had Joe Calorio. He was a star on a football team. A guy last name Stout. I worked for his father. Uh, his father was a milkman with my dad. And I'll never forget it. His only son was killed in Vietnam. And we had just tragic. We went to his funeral. And uh, so I remembered those funerals and going, son of a bitch, I'm not even above the fold anymore. And they lied. They said I died in Vietnam. Son of a bitch, I died in Laos. But I don't want my mother to know I died because I was too stupid to put a D-ring on. Well, fortunately, Captain Tuong um, descended. And right when I passed out, I thought I felt elephant grass. And I did. I fell maybe 10, 12 feet. I was unconscious. And Henry King came out, took off all my equipment, picked me up, and he threw me in the helicopter in the King V. And I can remember my head bouncing on the floor going, oh, ah, shit, that hurts. But it woke me up. And then I go, oh, well, I'm alive. <laughs> so it was happy pain. I call that happy pain. It's also the reason you don't have your uh, your knife, your K-bar. Oh, no, it, well, it, that was a SOG knife I had. Oh, a SOG, I'm sorry, knife. a SOG knife. Yeah, my SOG knife, my CAR-15. And my M set, my sawed off M79 had a special holster that was designed just to hold my sawed off M79 gone. But uh, I was well, at least you were alive. Oh, yes, sir. And that shitty uh, part in the newspaper never happened, never came to fruition. Yeah, we were lucky. And so, but see, an answer to your first question why on Christmas Day? Yeah, it all happened November and then in October, we had that mission where we were down to our last magazine where they stacked up the bodies to kill us. And I really just, again, it was a, a, a moment in time, you know, and um, as it turned out, we had another team got wiped out New Year's day. A week later, another team got wiped out. And that thought was rattling around the back of my mind. But again, when we got our target, we geared up and did the mission. We had to continue. So we can agree that you really loved your South Vietnamese counterparts, I would oh say, God, right? Yeah. They, so yeah. we had to earn each other's respect, really. <laughs> I'm glad you said that because what I'm about to talk about <laughs> is Sal didn't have really the greatest impression of you when you first came in to no, that's your. Pretty, you're very accurate, DJ. <laughs> <laughs> I think that he said you were too tall, your feet were too big, and you looked stupid. That's what he said. And <laughs> <laughs> and Hep, our interpreter, <laughs> and Hep, our interpreter, um, he wouldn't tell me what he said until around about Thanksgiving, like six months later. And uh, I kept saying, Hep, what did Sal say that first day I met him? Oh, you know, it was nothing. It was nothing. But I knew it was something because I saw how Hep reacted. And I saw how a couple of other Vietnamese reacted on the team. But Sal was, like I said, he was a stud. He must have weighed maybe 105 pounds soaking wet, but 50 pounds that it had to be hard. He was just a fearless warrior. And I'm alive was, thanks to Sal and Hep. He was actually your counterpart, correct? Correct. Okay. So I was the team leader, the SF, and then he was the team leader from the Vietnamese side. And everything I did, I would talk to him for the mission, mission prep, briefings, uh, training. We constantly trained. And he would always, we talked about it first and go through it. Then he would inspect the team, his people, before I inspected him. And and after a while, I just stopped doing it because Sal was so good at it. Why do you think, after that great entry of you two (laughs) relationship, why do you think, other than him being a fierce warrior, that you two just gelled? Well, again, this was May. And... On that mission from October 7th, that day we got pulled out by Captain Tin, which, by the way, that King Bee had 48 bullet holes in it. Some of them were from bullets. Some were from uh, higher caliber rounds. That one, one went through to one of the uh, propellers on the helicopter. Um, I'm sorry. I lost my train of thought, DJ. 
So we're we're talking about why you two gelled so well oh, so, after your introduction to each other. Yeah. So this is like five months later. I meet him in May. He has that assessment on that mission. <laughs> after we after we got pulled out, it was the most beautiful sunset we ever saw because the King Bee flew south for a few minutes, straight south, and out of our door on the right, facing west, we saw the most beautiful sunset we'd ever seen because we were still alive. Air five minutes ago, we thought we were going to be dead. And I looked over at Sal, and Sal looked at me, and he smiled. He went like, and I'll never forget that moment because that was the moment in time that Sal let me know that I measured up to what he wanted from a Green Beret. And it took me six months. It sounds so crazy to hear you say that you had to earn his respect. And and because you had earned all those other guys' respect, this, the Green Berets that you're with, the guys that you're working on your team, but it took six months. And from the way you describe it in every way, in every time that you talk about it, that was a huge thing in your military and combat life. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, that's the thing about uh, special forces. We... We train and we are trained in how to work with indigenous people. Because remember what the Green Beret model is. On our beret, there's a crest with crossed arrows. And the Green Beret model is de oppresso liber, to free the oppressed, not to conquer the world like Alexander the Great or the Russians or Adolf Hitler or that scumbag Mayo Testung, any of those commie bastards. No to free the oppressed. And today, there are over 80 Green Beret teams around the world to this day that are still working in countries to help people to learn how to defend themselves and to better their lives so that they could be free, not to be oppressed. And uh, through that training and learning how to work with indigenous people, in this case, my South Vietnamese, um, I was truly blessed. Um, and we had to earn their respect as well as they had to earn ours. Now, Sal, you know, Spider filled me in. We knew who he was and they, Sal and Hep hired all the new people and our team just went on. We trained hard when the missions came, we did our, to our best of our ability and then, uh, lived to come back to, to do another mission another day. Let's move on to Hep. You seem to have uh, an almost brotherly relationship with Hep. Well, yeah, because, you know, he's the interpreter. And uh, right to the end, I mean, he was just, he was bright. He spoke four languages. Um, he had been educated in special schools in uh, Vietnam that were French schools that his father was able to get him into. So he spoke the languages and he was a little smart ass. Always the smart ass, always had a quip. And sometimes he corrected my English because I was a victim of public schools. <laughs> but Hep had that really good education. And, uh, but more importantly, he was our interpreter. And of course, you know, during the course of us getting used to each other, um, we tested Hep. He didn't, he never knew it, but we tested him to make sure he would interpret exactly what I said when I became the team leader and, and, and that he did it in such a way that the team knew and that my message was conveyed, whether it was good news or bad news, I did it twice. And we basically had somebody listen. I had a, you know, a green beret that spoke, that spoke Vietnamese and they heard the conversation through the wall. So that way I could double check on them. But I just did that for CYA purposes, but always, Hep was always there for us. Um, did the whole first tour of duty with him. I came back to Vietnam. He was still on the team. In January, he had been offered a job at the uh, CCN, <clears throat> CCN um, headquarters. And more pay, less, <clears throat> excuse me, more pay, less work. Excuse me a second. Yeah. So I said, sure, take the job, please. And by that time, we had two other men on the team 
one was a interpreter from uh, Virginia that we hired and a guy named Hung, H-U-N-G. We had trained him speaking. He was a smart kid. And he, he was trained up enough where if I had been killed with the radio, Hep or Hung or Juan could have picked up the radio and talked to our Ford air controllers and worked out the strikes and whatever else we needed and talk to the um, talk to them in English. They knew what our terms were, including how to direct airstrikes. So, you have this trust with them, and I, I haven't heard you mention him a lot. I've heard you mention him, but but Fook, um, Fook. I re- uh, yeah. I, ha- now, how do you say it? Fook. Okay. P H O U C. Okay. The American version. It sounds very similar to that. That begins with an F and ends with a K. <laughs> So I've heard you talk about him a couple times, but can you kind of explain his role and and why he was so important to the team? Yeah. Fook, um, Fook Tuan, and Doti Kwong, who joined our team a little bit later, he had been on Alabama with Lynn Black on October 5th, 1968, but we hired him in 69. They had lived in North Vietnam. And after Dien Bien Phu fell, which was the French battle around May 8th, 1954, all of their families came south. They left North Vietnam because they knew that they would prefer to live south in a corrupt country, but it was better than being under the communist thumb in North Vietnam. And they were willing to die for it. So Fook was tough, physically tough, uh, very strong. And um, he was just an outstanding and a fearless point man. So for my first four or five months on the team, all of our missions, Fook always ran point, And then Sal would be behind him. And then Spider or Don Wolken or myself would be right behind Sal. And sometimes I would be behind Fook. And... Um, he was just an incredible man. He could, there were, he, he was good in the jungle. He was the one when we were moving, he would see the, the pit vipers, the snakes, anything else that was of danger on the ground. He would see it first. If I had been walking point, I would have walked right into the pit viper. And they had a thing, they, they had a, a thing called the two step snake where you, if, after it bit you, you took two steps and you were dead. Now, he would point these things out to us. He's really saved our lives so many times I lost count. Who was it that that saw the wire as you guys were coming in on the helicopter and Um, they had wired up a 500-pound bomb, but who actually observed that out of the helicopter? You know, 52 years later, 54 years later, I think it was either Fook or Sal. I just forget. But what had happened was the King Bee was spiraling down and either Fook or Sal saw a wire across the LZ. Now, how they saw that, anyways, because they're Vietnamese, they yelled to the door gunner who yelled to the pilot who aborted, and we pulled back, and then they came back, <clears throat> and they hit the area, and a 500-pound bomb exploded. So they knew we were coming, had time to wire a 500-pound bomb, had it gone off in our descent, the bomb would have gone out and just destroyed the helicopter and killed all of us. Well, and that goes back to your middle management and higher management again, because you had told them over and over and over that the radios were compromised, that you needed different kinds of radios. And and the the North Vietnamese were actually calling you guys out over the air. And you, you've cited numerous examples of when they call people out by their name. Now, my favorite is when... They tell some guy they know that he's there, and I can't remember his name. And he oh, no, no, says, no. No, "This is this is Lin- well." First of all, the radio operator was Doug, <laughs> the Frenchman Letourneau. Okay, so they're in his target. They're deep in Laos, and on the radio comes this voice speaking English: "RT Idaho, over, come in, RT Idaho." And Doug at first thought maybe it was Covey, but he couldn't hear any aircraft. So there's no aircraft. And it wasn't time for a regular combo check, either from a fact. We also had airborne command centers that flew over the AO every 
every day, every night, 24-7. And it wasn't them. So at some point, Lynn hears Doug talking to this guy. And Lynn goes, who the hell is it? Well, it was a Cuban. And the Cuban gets on the phone talking to Lynn and goes, you know, we know where you are. We're going to come get you. And Lynn goes, well, what do you, okay, well, let me tell you something. Here's my eight digit coordinate. Because didn't he give him, he gave him a four digit grid, right? Well, it was an eight digit. No, the One Cuban nine, gave him a four digit grid. Of a six. He had six. Okay. Okay. So he had six digits and then Lynn said, let me give you eight. Come and get me. And uh, then they talked a little bit. And then Lynn, the, the penultimate insult, which was, you know, your mother had to be a piss poor whore. Because had she been a good hooker, you would have gotten a job in America or in England or France. But because she was so bad in bed, you ended up here in Vietnam. She had to be piss poor. <laughs> and then told him, come get me. Yeah, come get me, mother. <laughs> so and they declined; they never came. Well, I mean that's good, but but there were other instances where you've you've talked to where they came on and told uh, at one point who was with them, and that might have been the same instance who was with them, and then they didn't mention someone because that person had just left. Right. Yeah. So that's that's the same team. You're okay. You're married, right. So Lynn Black was the team leader. Doug, the Frenchman, uh, Letourneau, was the assistant team leader, and they had a medic. And Fortenberry was the medic. So he had left the team to go home. He had de -roast. His time, uh, his one-year tour of duty had ended. He went home. And when that Cuban came up on the races, I know you, you're the one, two, you're the radio operator, you're Doug, the Letourneau, Frenchman, assistant team leader. Lynn Black is your one, zero. And he named some of the South Vietnamese that were on the team for that mission. And he never said Fontenberry, Fortenberry, who had gone home seven days earlier. That, that is really disturbing, but also shows you the degree of accuracy they had on their intel. Yeah, yeah. And, and it was crazy when you told me that. And, and what was even more crazy to me was you guys, like we talked about, could pick weapons and stuff like that. And you were way, you know, light years ahead of, of other units. But I wonder why the combo and that kind of stuff was so hard to get better equipment because you warned over and over and over again, we are compromised. We Codes are being given out. Uh, radio frequencies when they took the, when the Russians took the ship and pulled all that stuff off with the radio equipment, you guys said it over and over. So why was it so difficult to get that radio equipment? Uh, it just was a failure of communication between the teams on the ground, our commanders taking the word to Saigon in an emphatic kind of way where they would come back with better radio equipment. Because um, I've written a story for Soldier of Fortune that's appeared a couple other places now and with soft rep um, about how SOG was compromised. And I interviewed a CIA agent who talked to the Russians who were Vietnam vets who were in Vietnam and they, they were uh, radio operators. M most of the Russians were cannon cockers, artillery, dealing with the anti-aircraft rockets that knocked down our pilots both from jets, helicopters, anything like that. And they trained the North Vietnamese army to do those missions. Um, but uh, in this case, they were, they were amazed at the simplicity of the Prick 25. And then later on, they came out with another version of the Prick 25 that had another separate unit that was supposed to scramble your voice. And the damn things never worked. But they made us carry them in the field. So you had a radio, you needed batteries for it. You had a scrambling device, you needed batteries for it. And then you also had a plunger. There's a large metal plunger to be about this long, maybe a foot, a little over a foot, foot and a half long. And then every day you had to reset. They had pins at the bottom of this. And you had to reset and recalibrate the pins and then you got it and pushed it into the scrambler. And that would reset the scrambler so that you could talk 
and secure terms. Well, the ones we had never worked in the field. And that's what led to my uh, ending my career when I destroyed one when we were in the Ashaw Valley in April 1970. You want to talk about it? Uh, yeah, we had, uh, yeah, again, it was all comma related. I had talked to our commanding officer for CCN, talked to the sergeant major, talked to the people at S3, anybody who would listen. And Lynn Black, when he had gone to Saigon for a couple other after he left Idaho, he went down to Saigon for a couple of special missions that he still can't talk about. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> and when he was there, he mentioned the whole radio thing. And again, we had to get somebody to go talk to the people that gave us our equipment. Normally, the people that were in Okinawa, it was the acronym was CISO, C-I-S-O. And they were phenomenal. They gave us great stuff, great gear. We always had experimental weapons, pump M79s, rocket-fueled weapons, uh, pistols, poison pills, anything you wanted. They had it. Um, but for some reason, the radio thing was just, we were just screwed on. So whenever we were on the ground, we had absolute minimal uh, commo until once we were in contact and when you're in contact even then sometimes the nva would come up and get on your frequency play music and make noise so we couldn't talk from the ground to our uh ford air controller covey and it was just a uh, a long-term battle that was one of the major failures of the command of sog at that time so the last guy I want to talk about before we move on to your kind of final stuff and things that you're doing now, I want to talk about Johnny Mac, Johnny McIntyre. Oh, <laughs> my buddy. He was, he had a football scholarship to Notre Dame. And when he went to the interview, somebody said something that pissed him off. <laughs> and he said, fuck you. He went home, went to another college for a year, got bored. <laughs> Dropped out of college, and he read the book, The Green Berets by Robin Moore, like I did. And uh, joining the Army, we went through training group together. We were buds. His mother accused me of being the one that got him in trouble. My mother accused Johnny McIntyre of getting me into trouble. When they learned that we were demoted, you know, our, our moms blamed each other. And uh, then we went to Nam together. <clears throat> And uh, John was the first one to get, of all the guys from our commo group, John was the first one to get on the ground a short time. His lieutenant, his 1-0, uh, broke his ankle. He jumped out of the helicopter too soon, broke an ankle. They had a, uh, a very light firefight with the NVA, and he came back. And tragically, just on the 4th of July of 68, Johnny was in his... Um, in his team room and he was working his web gear with a knife he cut through the web gear <clears throat> and the knife hit a metal pole on his bed and carmed up and the blade went through his eye cut his eyelid and his eyebrow and it happened in the morning and they ran him over to the uh, marine corps base where they had the doctors and they, they had another firefight where people were coming in with wounds from combat. So they held Johnny back. And then about 4 or 5 o'clock, the doctor came and said, look, you know, you're not too serious. Um, we got a party we got to go to. It's the 4th of July. Uh, we'll see you in the morning. Well, by that time, tragically, an infection set in. Uh, he lost the vision in that eye. And he never came back. And uh, he was never the same because his dad had been a highly decorated <clears throat> infantryman from World War II. He fought in the Battle of the Bulls, earned a silver star. And uh, Johnny went back to New York, um, drank too much, had too many problems, and eventually died far before his time around 1998. And uh, he's buried up there in New York State. How'd you find out? Um, 
I'd had a friend of mine, a friend of his, who called me on a couple times, letting me know that uh, he had gone to, to John's father to get my phone number at work. And this guy called. We said so we developed a rapport, and we were both worried about Mac. I called Mac, tried to talk to him, but um, he just he just did. He never came back. He never bounced back from that tragic day. And um, like I said, he died ninety eight from too much booze and heartbroken. Did he ever talk to you about it? Oh yeah, quite a bit. And uh, we went down in 69 when we were up at Fort Devens. Uh, one night we drove from Devens to Trenton, which was like a 400 mile drive. And we left early in the morning. We stopped by to see McIntyre, me, Tony Harrell, uh, Rick Gestis, and uh, Don Radable, Dan Radable, and Don Loomis. So it was five of us. We went by his house. We stopped in to see him because we had all gone through training group together. And uh, and John several times said, you know, I let you guys down. I came home too early. And we said, stop talking like that, man. It was an injury. And, and, <clears throat> excuse me. And that line, he said to me several times over the next 20, 24 years before he died or 28 years before he died. And he just he just couldn't get it out of his head. It's uh, it's it's unbelievable to when you hear stories like that, these guys and, and I've said it numerous times that they went through so much adversity and everything like that. And that was the thing that really got to him of, of all the stuff that he saw of of putting himself out there. That oh, yeah. was what it was. Yeah. Yeah. And then we had like there's a guy who did the bright light for Idaho. His name was Mike Tucker. Great recon guy. After war, he had issues with PTSD, and his teammate, George Sternberg, a.k.a. the troll, he helped him, got him into the VA, got him a job. He's working, very successful at his new job. And So one day, he's coming out of the shower, and the shower is one of those deals where the door opens, and it has like a little piece of metal from the floor up, and then the door seals on that piece of metal to keep the water in the shower. Mike comes out of the shower, and he ran missions for over 18 months in SOG, including that bright light where he got shot up trying to find Spike Team Idaho and uh, with that team, uh, Spike Team Oregon. And uh, he slipped, and he fell backwards, and his neck landed on that metal from the door that the door clicked into, killed him instantly. It's just like, oh, and there's other tragic stories like that, but yeah, I mean, I go WTF times two. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's the whole thing that, that it, it, it's so mind blowing when you think about the littlest things. And it goes back to that question I ask you, does everything happen for a reason? Well, you know, I'm just a mere mortal. That kind of question is way above my pay grade. (laughs) Yeah. I, I, I want to think that there's a reason for it, but you and I are just not quite smart enough. Even there, you, you go. At all, we may not know what the final answer is, but I want to believe that there is a reason for it, and someday maybe we'll we'll get the answer. Absolutely. So let's let's move on to POW MIA efforts. Your your flag behind you. Uh, yes, as of March 1st, 2021, we had 1,584 still missing in action. Uh, of those, 488 are non-recoverable. So first, can we talk about the non-recoverable? What's that mean and what what can be done in order to, to change that number, if there can be anything? Uh, they can't. Those are the ones that are the uh, aviators, probably mostly Navy, shot down, their uh, aircraft is damaged over Hanoi or over Vietnam for bombing run or Laos. They head back to their carrier, but before they can get to the carrier, they crash. So before the carrier can get a rescue aircraft <clears throat> out to them, they can't. They their aircraft sinks to the bottom of the South China Sea, some places which is very deep. And of course, 
we have lost uh, pilots in Vietnam. I mean, Laos and Camp Laos and North Vietnam, where uh, you know the bombing runs in Hanoi. It was just and again. Here's the Russians, given Russians in China, given the latest state of the art um, weaponry to knock down our aircraft, and um, we lost a lot of good Americans on that, and so. Even when the POWs came home in nineteen in uh, February nineteen seventy three, um, that was um, what was not accounted for was the secret war in Laos and Cambodia, and uh, that's where that number is today. It's still one thousand five hundred and eighty four Americans from Southeast Asia from the Vietnam War, which includes fifty Green Berets. And 83 aviators that died, at least 83 aviators that died supporting us on the ground. Now, one of the problems, though, and I don't know if it's in Cambodia or Laos, they they have a very acidic soil that if we don't get to some of these quickly or even by now, we're not going to be able to recover anything. That's true. And it's tragically true. So between the final estimates, and I haven't heard from... Um, an official anthropologist that works with our government, somebody we trust. But the acidic soil is such that the latest estimate you heard from some of the uh, people from the DPAA, the Department of POW, MIA Accounting Agency uh, for the federal government, um, said the acidic oil is so it's the most acidic in the world. So it means it literally eats all the bones, your fingernails, the only thing it may not eat would be teeth. And uh, so five to 10 years, if they don't get, on our government right now, DPAA is, um, it's very discouraging because they're very much focused now on the PR that they're getting from recovering the remains of World War II and Korean War veterans. And we, I don't begrudge any of that bring them home that's fine but don't do it at the expense of the vietnam recovery mission which they've done you know uh we had a briefing three years ago where it was revealed that dpaa used to have over a dozen um analysts these are people that are trained in the history of vietnam the POW MIA issue, they have documents, they follow up the lead, they're analysts. That's what they do. They're trained to do that. And there's over a dozen at DPA. Today, there's two. And one of those two or three, they just hired somebody. And the person they hired is more like public relations stuff. They're not a, a trained analyst, somebody that goes out and works with the ground crews and or looks at all the intel reports and say let's go have a mission there the analysts now have been stripped of that power so the few that are left wind up doing reports they do family um, briefings but they're so overrun with work and a lot of it's just paperwork instead of being analysts and then uh, the laboratories are controlling the movements of the teams in the field. And what they're going for is the public relations. Whenever they bring, again, it's, it's righteous when they bring them home, but they're doing it at the expense of the Vietnam War. I don't give a damn what DPAA or any of their people say. That's what they're doing, and it's not right. And I think at some point we need a day of reckoning, somebody just to say, you know what, we're done shut this stupid agency down or just come out and be honest with the american people we ain't going to vietnam no more write them off and then go ahead and get your cheap ass headlines from going to um disinterments in hawaii or other sites where they know there are anywhere from a, like a ship goes down or a b-17 or a b-24 has a 12 or a 13 man crew they go in and get to that site 
they know they can get more bodies out as opposed to a recon team where they only have two Americans. And uh, they get a bigger bang for the buck. And they had a one of their directors, as far back as 2016, said for the record for the Hawaii, one of the Hawaii newspapers, that they were in, they were in fact going to do that. They're going to de-emphasize Vietnam, go for the headlines, get a bigger budget, and do more from that side. So the big, I think the total numbers are something like 88,000. When you put all together, World War II, um, maybe even some World War I for good luck, Korean War and Vietnam. And out of that, probably 40,000 plus are unrecoverable. These are plane crashes, ships that are destroyed during World War II in, in both theaters, Europe and uh, Asia. Then that leaves you with the remains from World War II and Korean War. And, you know, Vietnam, the families, when, when we had our POWs that were being mistreated, the Vietnam f- families of the POWs were the first in the history of our country to petition North Vietnam to treat the American POWs better because we had reports about how poorly they were treated. And people that were involved in that, remember we had the POW MIA bracelets that came out, bumper stickers. Like when I came home, I, I put together a POW MIA concern center at our college. We handed out thousands of bumper stickers, literature, and people could buy a bracelet for two fifty. dollars That supported our effort to get more publicity to the POW MIA effort. And uh, Ann Mills Griffith's father and her were involved because her brother was a backseater in an F-4 that got shot down in the, in the South China Sea, but near the shoreline in September of 66. And that family was involved her dad was one of the first chairman, and today it's called the National League of POW MIA Families. Anne has been the CEO director for the last four or five decades. She's gone through three husbands, and this woman is now 80 years old, and she works day and night every day on this mission to this day. Her brother was, his remains were recovered. He was buried with full honors at Arlington a few years ago. And regardless, irregardless, she continues to uh, move on with this mission. And she is very critical of DPAA. And she, she knows it by chapter and verse. And this woman is driven. And she's a saint in my heart and mind uh, for all she's done in an effort to bring home our veterans, our Americans from, the, from Southeast Asia, from the Vietnam War. If we can talk about real quick, I don't know that you're with these guys anymore. I know that you were up until at least a year or two ago, the Veterans Affordable Housing Program. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, yeah. until I moved to Tennessee. My right. wife and I moved to Tennessee in September of uh, 2020. We left uh, corrupt California behind. But I had the uh, honor of working with uh, the Veterans Affordable Housing Program out of Orange, County uh, in Orange, uh, California, and um, is a, just a great program. The driving force there is an old, is an original Green Beret. His name is Richard Simonian, who turned 90 years old on Sunday. And Richard has uh, a company, and then is we are affiliated with a nonprofit where that's where I worked for over 10 years. And we help veterans get affordable housing. And then the veterans that were in some of these different units, um, we had 45 uh, affordable housing communities in the five Western states. And in the last year, he's expanded with one more in Colorado. And um, so I worked with the veterans, with programs, with them, helping to get affordable housing, bring public attention to the needs. And since I've left, and since August 16th of last year, when we had that debacle in Afghanistan, the complete embarrassment and ineptitude of the Biden administration 
and this, and again, the State Department, those lying, deceptive lowlifes. I want to have stronger language, but you you can. Now, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We've heard it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but more importantly, the Veterans Affordable Housing Program has established two of their communities for Afghan families that supported the Green Berets or other American units in Afghanistan. And they've hired a young, well, young by my standards, who uh, his, his, we just call him Nemo. And Nemo was, he fought with several different Green Beret units during the war. He has at least three or four letters and citations from each separate Green Beret team. He was wounded multiple times, had a leg, re had a part, partially replaced one of his legs. And in fact, a few months ago, he needed a new prosthesis. So we had a fundraiser. We raised $40,000 to give him a new leg. And now Nemo, whose English is flawless, he is vetting the Afghans that come in and they're getting placed with jobs and training as well as housing and the Veterans Affordable Housing Program. And um, both of those units, I believe, are in uh, Southern California. So we got to move on to your podcast and the oh. books that you've written. So let's <laughs> talk about it. I don't, uh, I, I, I want to push this out because this was new to you and you kind of took it on and, and, uh, you've kind of ran with it now. Well, yeah, but I, I couldn't have done it without, without Jocko Willink. Um, several years ago now, maybe five or six years ago, my wife, she's a she was learning about podcasts because she's always ahead of me and anything that's technical well you know how wise are but my wife is particularly savvy on the on a podcast she goes you know there's a navy seal in san diego now we lived in san diego county but we lived in the north part of the county and san diego was like 40 miles from our house up in oceanside she goes this navy seal does these podcasts you should listen to him and he interviewed jordan peterson and a couple other really big names. And, uh, but you know, I was slow to react. And then finally a friend of mine, well, actually he is the brother of one of our green berets that went missing in action on November the 10th, 1969, his recon team got wiped out. And, uh, so Jim Suber is the brother of Randy Suber who was a one assistant team leader that got wiped out on that date. And Randy goes, Hey, I mean, uh, Jim goes, Hey, you got to talk to this guy. So he, he mailed my book to Jocko and uh, I freshly heard from Jocko and uh, we did our first interview May 30th. And then he posted that interview, which is Jocko podcast number one, eight zero. And now we've had over 800,000 views on that one. And then we followed up with Jocko. There's been seven more, 181, 82, 86, and then 247, 248, 258, and 259. And right near the end of those last two podcasts, I said, you know, Jocko, we got some more guys you got to interview. And uh, he goes, why don't you interview him? I said, well, yeah. I said, with your time and your money, we can go places. He goes, yeah, let's do it. And Jocko, to my utter amazement, was a man of his word. And I, we moved to Tennessee, and uh, he goes, let's do this. You go ahead and interview these guys. Bring them out. We want to get these SOG stories out. We'll call them SOGcast. Okay, Jocko. And every, every interview that we've had, Jocko and his his team pay for their flight out, hotel rooms, meals, and car rentals. And we're talking thousands of dollars here. This is no small effort. I live in Tennessee, and so far we got 28 interviews that are in the can. And Jocko's team, led by Echo Charles, his right-hand man, and now Kerry Halton is helping, they... Um, are posting the audio interviews first, and then they're following with the YouTube interviews. So we're now up to 
about a week and a half ago, they posted number 23 on the audio. And the YouTube, they posted was number, they're getting ready to post number seven, which will be on YouTube. So if you just Google Jocko, J-O-C-K-O podcast, number uh, 180, that'll pop up. Then with Sodcast, if you just go to Apple or Spotify, the audios are there. You just put in Sodcast and uh, they'll pop. And then for YouTube, the uh, Sodcast and the number 001 or 002, and then they're available on YouTube. And the very first interview that I did was George Sternberg from Spike Team Oregon that came in with a bright light. He had 10 years in, in the Army. Most of it was Special Forces. And, and uh, just incredible interviews. And that first one now has over 155,000 views. And people are responding to that. And thank you for asking because, and again, Jocko has done more for getting out SOG history than any anybody that I'm aware of or any element or association or anything. It's thanks to him. And people, I, I still, every day, I will get at least one to two, either Instagram or an email. Hi, I enjoy your SOGcast or your Jocko podcast. And um, from around the world, I've got people that have come in from Australia, New Zealand, a couple from China, but uh, we don't take that too seriously. But um, And even Hungary. And it's just amazing the stories that are getting out there thanks to podcasts like yours. <laughs> well, you won't be able to control how many come in from this one. It'll just be unbelievable. So uh, <laughs> let's talk about SOG Chronicles and uh, your three books. Oh, thank you. Yes, my website is SOG Chronicles. And if any, if so it's www.SOG, S-O-G Chronicles, one word, all lowercase, dot com. If you click on the website, in the upper right-hand corner, there's blog. And you'll find all of the Jocko interviews. We post them there on my website. All of the SOGcast are there, both the audio and the uh, YouTube versions, and a couple other podcasts. So when you post yours, I'll put it on my website and then put out a little note on uh, my Instagram. I don't know. We got 40 some. My daughter told me we got 40,000 plus uh, followers now on Instagram. So I'm still learning about the social media stuff. And, uh, like my, my wife and I, we were blessed with three grandchildren now, and we're still settling into our home in Tennessee. And I hope to write book four. So the books, the first one, as you said earlier, was across the fence, the secret war in Vietnam. And then we did the expanded version, which came out about 10 years ago. And we, expand it we put in 50 photographs three new chapters and we expanded the glossary in the back with terminologies and one of the chapters included what we carried and what we didn't carry and then on the ground was the second book uh co-authored with john peters who ran recon with spike team rhode island and john is just a guy who's just scary bright he's a phenomenal writer He's very modest, but <clears throat> there are parts of on the ground that are just, they just sing. And I always give credit to John for that because he rewrote some of the chapters I worked on and some of his stories are in there. And then John is Sogcast, I think number six. So Sogcast 006 is John Peters. And then the third book was Sog Chronicles where we focus, the main focus is um, Operation Tailwind which was the most successful <clears throat> hatchet force where you had 116 in Didge and then uh, 16 Green Berets that went in for a four-day mission and deep into Laos. They destroyed several caches. They helped to save a CIA operation. And uh, the Green Berets received 32 Purple Hearts on that, on that one mission alone. And uh, just an incredible mission. In it, we talk about another mission where a recon team was hit really hard and the team was being extracted. The final team, final part of the team was being extracted and um, it was um, 
two Americans in a ditch and Sammy Hernandez. Well, Sammy's rope broke. He fell to the ground, was knocked unconscious. Um, and the other three were being lifted up and a helicopter got hit and was our, our, I think it was RT intruder helicopter crashed into a granite mountain, killing the entire crew and killed the two Americans in the adige that were on the rope. Sammy recovered consciousness, hid from the NVA that afternoon, deep in through the night. And at one point he had to get up and pop his shoulder back in on a tree because it dislocated his shoulder when he fell to the ground. And Sammy got pulled down, went on to a remarkable career as a Special Forces Green Beret. And those are the three books I hope to come out, begin writing, Saw Chronicles. The third book is called Saw Chronicles, Volume 1. Hope to begin Volume 2. And the motto will be, write till we die. Because there's so many Saw stories that haven't been told yet. And they're going to come back and and rewrite one story, which was the attack on August 23rd, 1968 at FOB4, where on a single night we lost 16 Green Berets in a sapper attack that the NVA and the Viet Cong had planned for over a year. And it was the single greatest loss of Green Berets in one battle in our short history of uh, now 70 years. I, I, the stories that you tell are just amazing in your books. When you do lectures, I, I really like to watch you do lectures like one-on-one lectures because you, uh, you just kind of go through the stories. You know what I mean? There's nothing to kind of interrupt you and things like that. I, I, it's absolutely fantastic that you're doing this. You should be very proud of what you've done because I think you're giving the world a look at a history that a lot of people had no idea even existed before you came around and and started getting this information out there. Well, it's true. And again, had it not been for Jocko Willink with his podcast that spun off to help with the book sales, and then through that, I've met people, literally everything from people that are in the Army now, in the Marine Corps, said, hey, you know, I read Across the Fence 20 years ago, or I read your story when you wrote for Soldier of Fortune magazine. I had a Nome de, Nome de Gere when I wrote for Soldier of Fortune for Bob Brown because um had my newspapers. If they knew I was writing for Soldier, they would have fired my ass in a New York City set. <laughs> what are you talking right. about? That is an upper crust publication, sir. Uh, yeah, yeah. You and I know that's the way we feel, but liberal <laughs> editors... They don't quite view Soldier of Fortune magazine the same way that you and I do. Absolutely. And I, Robert Brown has become a, a really good friend. In fact, I'm hoping to record him for a sodcast someday, uh, hopefully before the end of the year. We're trying to – we're entering negotiations now. And, and Bob is 89 years old, sharp as a razor blade mentally and physically. He's just – his hearing is a little bit – leaves a little bit to be desired. <laughs> Well, it's amazing that you're doing it. Guys, you can find uh, so much about him on the internet. Let's look for the books. It's Across the Fence, On the Ground, and the Sog Chronicles. Sog Chronicles Part 2 should be coming out. Uh, And then, of course, the website, SogChronicles.com. It's all one word. You can go there. You can find all the podcasts that he's done, the video versions of them. Find out about the books, and you can actually order from that site. So I think that's going to be about it for the show this week. Uh, I think we have covered a ton of stuff, and uh, I'm so happy that you're there. Guys, you can find him once again at the Sog Chronicles. Look him up there. You can pick up the books. Of course, we'll have all the links at dtdpodcast.net. You guys know that's the one-stop shop for this podcast. You get the audio version, the video version, pictures of John, where you can pick up the books and all of his links. Also, don't forget, go to our sponsor, Police Coffee at policecoffee.com. We talk about them every week, but I'm going to do it again. It's an officer-owned business that's dedicated to crafting the finest coffees and blends and shipped as soon as they're made to provide you with the freshest coffee available. Each batch is roasted fresh by people who know what it means to stay vigilant, and their specialty coffees do not waste one drop when flavor is concerned. Their coffee some of the best you'll find. But also remember, it serves an important cause, giving back to our community. 50% of our profits go towards helping family members of police officers who fell in the line of duty. 
When you go to the site at policecoffee.com and order yours, make sure you put in the code DJK10, and that will get you 10% off your order. Once again, guys, don't forget dtdpodcast.net. You can find us on Facebook at the DTD Podcast. You can find us on YouTube at the DTD Podcast, and you can find us on Instagram at the DTD underscore podcast. That's going to be it, John. Thank you so much for coming by and telling your story. That's going to be it for this week. That's John. I'm DJ. Catch us on the next one. We'll see you later. Airborne.